Joe Adams, thank you very much for coming in today. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jake. It's great to be here, really. It really is. Welcome to the studio. This is the uh, basement of the music department, I guess you would call it, or the auditorium. And this is where Chesrae Chez and I have been doing doing episodes for the past couple of years. So mm-hmm. welcome in. Yeah, it's nice to be here. I, I, uh, I've seen a few episodes. I think it's really well done, and I really appreciate you asking me to uh, be part of it. Thank it's you. Really yeah, nice. I was psyched when you uh, when you said that you would, might be interested. So mm-hmm. thanks for coming in. Sure. Um, so I want to ask you a little bit about pickleball, and we, that's the first conversation we ever had was about pickleball. You're you're the biggest pickleballer that I know, probably. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And um, so I want to ask you. Yeah, you brought you even brought your pickleball paddles mm-hmm. in. Do you do you call it a paddle or a racket? A paddle. You call it a paddle. Oh, sure. That's the correct term. Yeah. Uh, you should call it a paddle. Yeah. So my question is, uh, why do you think pickleball is such an addicting game? It's the fastest growing sport in the United States. It was labeled that. I just read in some magazine or, or the U.S. Fitness Society labeled it the fastest growing sport in the United States. What, what's so addicting about the sport? Yeah, good question. So, uh, you know, when you think back when we first met Henry's party, uh, you played. You were one of the few people I know at Gilman that uh, that actually had some experience with pickleball. So, you know, I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> <laughs> and as a, a big lacrosse player, and and me, we can play in the same. We've probably played maybe a hundred games over the last last years. You know, either yeah. as opponents or, or partners. And you know, where is there a venue where you and I can play uh, sort of equally, right? Uh, a great D1 athlete and a math teacher. So pickleball has a great equalizer effect, I think, that draws people in and um, lets them lets them participate in a, in a fun activity, which is, a, you know, a sport. Yeah, that's what I tell people who are just – because a lot of people haven't played pickleball or don't really know what it is. They feel like they've seen it. It's similar to tennis, they say. And I tell them it doesn't really matter if you've ever played before. Just come out because yeah. you yeah. play one or two games and you're right there with – with the best players almost yeah, well yeah in a sense but also if you lose you lose quickly and it's it's, it's not so bad that way that's true so how so when someone asks you how would you describe pickleball what do you say it's ping pong it's mostly ping pong you stand on the table yep yeah that's I like how that. i describe it so <laughs> get a little exercise I, I like to say it's it's ping pong on a tennis court almost there you go because it's what is it half the size of a tennis court almost it's the size of a volleyball court size of a volleyball court I was. I mean, a badminton court. Excuse me, badminton court. Yeah. So I was reading about the origin of pickleball. Yeah. You know, you you probably know the whole origin of the story. Not necessarily. No. So it was founded in outside of Seattle, Washington, a place called Bainbridge, Washington, and it's actually Washington State sport now. I didn't even know they had state sports, but uh, it was founded in eighteen or nineteen sixty five, and it became popular in nineteen sixty five in Washington. But then spread, I don't, and I want to know why the reason for this is in 2020, it spread all across the United States. Um, Maybe us. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. We spread the word. We've been doing it for a while. The good gospel. Uh, But the sport started, this family, the Pritchard family was looking for, they they came home from golf. They were golfing and they were, the kids were bored. I guess they had little kids. And the parents told them, go create a game. Mm Mm-hmm. And they were going to play badminton, but they couldn't find the shuttlecock. So they had to substitute, and they pulled in a wiffle ball. Mm -hmm. And I think the father, Pritchard I know is the last name, named the sport pickleball because um, a pickle boat in crew, and I don't know too much about crew, but a pickle boat is all of the rowers who aren't on the main boats they're just scrapped together and they're just put in the last empty boat i guess Mm -hmm. i could be wrong on that but it's all the scrap pieces that the kids found around their house the wiffle ball the badminton net the you know the lines they drew in with crayon or whatever and they called it they called it pickleball or the father called it pickleball didn't know that yeah yeah that's good that's good (laughs) so i don't know it really took on it's great to have it at gilman um I wouldn't mm-hmm. mind talking about a little more, depending how this this goes out. But I'm I'm definitely sort of the poster child for pickleball, and I, I do like it a lot. Yeah. When did you start first start playing pickleball? Uh, probably seven years ago. It's it's one more year since you've been here. So how long have you? It's uh, been five years for so me. Here. Oh, this about, is my fifth year. So maybe about six six and a half years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely so fun. It's addicting, right? I think it's the. 
don't know if it's the sound of the ball, it's the equalizing effect, it's the social aspect of it. Every time you play, you get to meet new people and play with a different partner and different opponents. Everything mm-hmm. combined just makes it a great, great. So sport. the Wednesday nights that you set up, the uh, in the auditorium, you know, I I meet uh, Elise in a lower school, Sam, Colin. There's just so many people that I know at Gilman now through playing pickleball in other divisions, including yourself. It's uh, it's been great that way. Um, it's probably one of the uh, how I know most people at Gilman mm-hmm. is is probably through uh, playing pickleball with different people in different divisions. So it's nice. Yeah, it's true. It's great to. Uh, I think even on the professional development days here, have pickleball, and then you really start to talk to people and get to know other divisions, and it's just a fun social game. It really picked up after we did a couple PD days with pickleball. Really I think so. Mm-hmm. I think the the mass email that I've been doing on Wednesday nights, just sending it to whoever I can scrap together on an email list, mm-hmm. and just saying, hey, we're going to be in the gym at 8 o'clock. If you'd like to come, come out, and you know, people spread the word. Because yep. it doesn't matter how many people are there. You can always set up more nets. And it's the hardest part is drawing the lines of the courts, I would say. Mm-hmm. It is. But <laughs> luckily they make, you can buy the the little pads that you put on the floor and you just have to use a measuring tape to, to draw out the court. But maybe pickleball courts are in the works at Gilman. So I can envision it because uh, I certainly put a lot of tape down over the years in different courts, and that's always been fun for the people who have to um, redo the courts uh, and uh, the floors. So I would like some uh, see some outdoor pickleball courts uh, for Gilman in the works. It's I think everybody's on board. It's just a matter of figuring out where to put it and how to put it in. So we'll be playing in uh, really nice courts, and a lot more people will be involved, I think, uh, hopefully this summer if it all works out nicely. That would be great. It'd yeah, be a lot of fun. Would be, would be. I could see it as a intramural team, uh, almost right away. It's already in the sixth grade. Uh, Ren and uh, Bren, Bren knows it can be an intramural in the, in the upper school, and and Ren said we can get some scrimmages. And of course, I think I told you um, my goal would be try to get some teachers from other schools. You know, St. Balls and. Mm-hmm. Uh, boys Latin get some games going on that'd be fun that would be teacher great. versus teacher at first and then maybe the kids too yeah so uh, I can see it as a sport at Gilman uh, I uh, can too and I it's funny I've been thinking of ways because I teach the upper school boys and, and I have classes with the girls they come over for classes and I really like how Gilman does the tri-school coordination right because the boys then have experience with the girls in the same classroom and it's not just an all boys school here because they have that coordinate program in 11th and 12th grade but I think it would be really awesome if they had an outlet to interact with female students outside the classroom and outside you know the 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 rare Friday night dance right you know something that's social and fun and interactive but not you know it's Friday night and you know all bets are off kind of deal yeah I could definitely see that and it's a good benefit I mean it's worked for us yeah so uh that's great. It's worked for the faculty. Yeah. yeah. So Wednesday nights, if you're listening to the episode, come out Wednesday, Wednesday nights. Night. Mr. Holmes, uh, direct challenge there, you know, right, <laughs> right to you. So he'll, he'll be there now. You know it. You can count on that. The guy loves the challenge. Yeah. So, um, so Joe, tell me a little bit about how you, uh, how you got to Gilman. Like, what was your first experience coming here um, for, for a job or for an interview? Hey, thanks for asking. Uh, so I have a great story. Uh, I wanted to be a teacher since – seventh grade uh, seventh grade and I wanted to be a math teacher in a middle school so uh, I feel you know the the, the back side of that is I, I I'm here you know I can't think of any other better place to be than right there in the middle school where I sit teaching math I mean I'm really happy but how I got there um, <clears throat> I, I started early you know there's it's you know to get into Gilman you, you were uh, you came uh, as a fellow mm-hmm. well, I came as a summer school teacher uh, that's what I did. I, I taught uh, for summer school one year, and I walked on the campus, and I felt like, oh, this is like a college. This I really like. I really like this place, and that's a feel I got. I didn't know a whole lot about uh, necessarily Gilman the way I know now, but everything I knew was good. Mm-hmm. So I um, started teaching for a year, uh, five, uh, seven weeks, five days a week, three hours a day, algebra one in this one room in the middle school. If you know it with the windows. Met some few people. I remember Anton uh, you know, holding court in the office and seeing all the, you know, Ron and, and different people. Come back the next year, 
I really wanted to work there, but there was no positions. And I have to thank the guy that <clears throat> started Charm City Run. He decided to quit and open a business, uh, Levinson, right? Isn't it, Ben? Mm -hmm. So uh, there was an opening, and it was early in, in the summer school. So my second year, and I'm in the room, sandals, T-shirt, and shorts. <laughs> and there were, I think, seven or eight students and myself, and uh, we're just at that moment where we all realize that no one wants to be there for three hours a day, seven day, uh, seven weeks, five hours a day. So there was this bond of we're all in this miserable situation together, and the kids started laughing, and you know I'm carrying on with them, and we're, we're really bonding well. So in walks uh, Ron Culbertson, and he goes, uh, "Could I talk to you after class?" And I went, "Oh no, you know I'm like laughing with all these kids, and we're all carrying on." What's he going to say? So I go talk to him in my shorts and sandals and, and T-shirt. And Ron says, have you ever thought about working in an independent school? And I have, because that's sort of the reason why I was there. Mm -hmm. And um, so he talks to me. It was a Tuesday. Uh, he talks to me a little bit. And I'm really interested. And I said, well, uh, Ron, I'm under contract with Baltimore County. I'd have to, you know, there's a day you have to break it in early July if you're going to break it. So that was a Tuesday. He said, you know, um, after we finished talking, come back on Thursday, had the contracts ready, you signed them and hired, just like that. It was wow. That easy. So I got hired with sandals and a t-shirt. That's and, amazing. Yeah, that was pretty cool, huh? And it was uh, great because Ron and, you know, you don't get just Ron Culbertson, you get the whole family, Gordon, Sue, the two kids, Kevin and, and Keith. They really sort of took me under their wing and helped me out a lot and just provided that support for a new teacher that, that was really great. And... Um, pretty thankful for for all that so a big shout out to the whole Culbertson group that's uh, amazing yeah so I'm, I'm wondering why did, how did you know you wanted to be a teacher in seventh grade yeah so I just had good experiences in in my middle school and who um, was your middle school where, you, where it was you our, our lady of victory all my schools are out of business uh, it's it was in uh, Catonsville area K to eight and uh, that, you know, enjoyable experiences. I like the teachers. And I guess, you know, in some ways, I'm a first-generation college student, uh, you know, from both sides of my family. There wasn't a lot of college going on. So you sort of pick things that you see in life, and, and teachers are largely what I saw. But um, I never looked back. I always wanted to be a teacher. It took me a while to get there, but definitely always wanted to be a teacher, a math teacher in the middle school. Was there a math teacher you had that really sold you on that dream? That wasn't math teachers. It was a science teacher. Uh, he's a department at UMBC now, Jeff Mitchell, and there was a, a Sister Catherine Carroll, uh, eighth grade LA teacher, who uh, come to mind right away as, as two people that, you know, help me point in that direction. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. Makes wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Seventh grade, that's pretty rare to know what you want to do. Seventh, eighth grade, probably, middle and, school. And yeah. to fulfill the dream. Took a while, but yeah. Yeah. So. So, um, why math? I just always liked math, you know, it was one of the things I, I like to do and, um, you know, now that I'm teaching, I even like it more uh, and I specialize in the middle school math, so, uh, you know, you get to know something, it's like 80s music, you, you really can, if you specialize in one thing, Yeah. so I like the way the boys learn and, and how they approach it and uh, I feel pretty good about what I do. Yeah, I, I was never naturally gifted at math, I was telling my class the other day because someone was doing a math homework in my English class before class started and I was like oh I I look at that and it looks like gibberish to me I just never really clicked with it I went to this woman named Miss Roach and I should write her a thank you note and she had a room just like this mm -hmm. at Conestoga High School and she would just sit in this room all day just like this room and and help people she was a tutor she would she would tutor you on your homework whenever you wanted to come in you can come in at any time that's great you didn't even really have to schedule an appointment so i would be in there first thing in the morning and i would say miss roche i i need your help i, I really need, need some help so yeah. she she really got me to where i needed to be in math but it just never english did but math it never really clicked for me some people it does it probably clicked well enough or good enough for you whatever you're an english teacher it's it's, it's rewarding to help people get past the hump of not feeling good about math. So as you're talking, I am, I'm pretty confident if we could work out some problems, you'd feel really good about it, Jake. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. how, do you, uh, how do you make math fun for people who don't find it fun? So you don't always. 
you don't always, but what you do is you string together a bunch of successes. That's that's the, the bottom line. They, once they get, uh, the guys feel good about what they do and they know they can do it and, and you believe in them and they believe in yourself, uh, it's much like a coach, right? So um, that's how that's how you do it. And, mm -hmm. and it, it helps to have experience to know where their mistakes will, will fall and give them some examples. But, but the idea is you believe in them, they like you, there has to be a connection, right? And mm -hmm. once that connection is there and, and they start believing in themselves, the, the guys over the years, Good things can happen, really. Uh, really good things can happen in the classroom, even the most reluctant learners. Yeah. yeah, I think the connection point is so important. You know, even on a day like today when I had some things that I wanted to cover in class and we're talking about Ralph Waldo Emerson and some important some important texts that we're reading in English, I feel like the first 10, 15 minutes of class, you always have to ask a question that is unrelated to the material. It's like, what are you most grateful for this holiday season and what are you going to be doing over break? Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, I just don't feel like you have much time in the upper school, maybe it's different in the middle school, to talk to all your students and really get to know them if you don't section off a little bit of class to make that connection. Certainly have to get the feel. You know, right now, World Cup is a, is a you know big thing everywhere, so it's easy to make that connection. But it's more than that. The... the uh, in the middle school, a middle school boy really won't work or learn if they don't like you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and it, it just won't happen. So uh, there has to be some connection, and it doesn't have to be in the classroom. Uh, it could be at the pickleball court. It could be in athletics. Mm -hmm. It could be, you know, in, in, in seeing the band or playing the music, whatever it is. And Gilman provides lots of opportunities for connection over the years, which is really cool. So you might meet a young man in sixth grade, but not really teach in the middle eighth, and the connection's already there. You know, where they want to go to college, you know their middle name, you know things about them, they know things about you. Um, it helps a lot. Right. It really does. And it must be cool as a middle school teacher to see these boys grow up and go off and graduate. And, you know, you they leave your classroom, but they're still on campus, and you see them thriving in the upper school a couple of years later. Thanks for asking. That is probably the best thing about having some experience. 23 years or so years at Gilman. Uh, barely six weeks go by before I don't get a big hug from someone somewhere and talking about middle school math. I think just Wednesday, you know, I walk in and Mac Franklin comes walking up to me and gives me a big hug and says, you know, talks about his, both his brothers, they're all three, and, uh, and we spent, I know, 20 minutes talking about experiences in the middle school. That type of, um, you, you know, it's it's more than just uh, gratitude, good feeling. I am overflowing with gratitude now, and uh, and it happens so often that um, it's it's really uh, one of the nicest things in my life is to be here for that long and have that experience. And just the number of guys I work with that came through my class at Gilman is is quite. And Mike Hanley is, you know, in the shop now filling in. Um, he was in my math class, and he's making he's making really nice violins and basses for people. He's filling in the shop, so you know it's nice to have that reconnection with him again. And it goes on and on and on and on. So it's really wonderful. Yeah, that's the that's the most one of the most impressive and cool things about Gilman School is so many people want to come back after they graduate and teach and still be around this place. That's true. It really is, and there's a lot of them. Yeah. And I, I try to tell my classes that a little bit, too, because a place like this is really rare because there are so many people who care about the students and want them to succeed and are here to help them. And if they go off the, the right track, they're here to help them, you know, get back in in line and focused and making sure they're okay and it's not really like that in other schools for one but also when you graduate and you go to college you're you're probably not going to have the same support systems that you do at a place like this that's so true and then the you come here for an education often of families you know uh, it's a great decision the education is great but what you end up leaving with is is lifelong friends and you don't have to even be best friends in in, in school as soon as you you're in New Orleans and you, you see a, a classmate or you see a Gilman grad or someone you know from Gilman, it's instant and it's it's a connection and that's your whole life, you know, your whole life. And that, I think, is one of the best values and the best benefits, I think, of, of um, a Gilman education is that lifelong friendships. And I, I say that a lot and I really believe it. Yeah, the people you sit with in some random class in, you know, ninth grade or fifth grade or whatever it is, 
you see that person down the line and everything comes back to you. It comes back. It it's does. pretty amazing. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's a very very nice nice thing. It truly is. Now, did you um, did you recognize this about Gilman when you first started teaching here, or did it take did it take some years to really understand what Gilman is all about and the and the privilege of of being involved in a place like this? Yeah, in the beginning, I was more focused on uh, what I was doing in a classroom. You know, is this math problem correct? Is is this the way you do things? Can I control the class behaviorally? Things like that. Is more thinking about me as a new teacher. Um, so no, it, that came, it, it didn't really start happening until 15, 16 years when, you know, Richard Schock comes back to work or the Joe Valentine White comes back to work. It brings up memories. It, it brings up memories. And then I realized it's, it's, it's a, a long term. So in the beginning, no. In the beginning, it was more the craft of teaching, surviving in the classroom and, and things like that. Yeah. Hmm. It's also interesting thinking about just how the mind works too is that you have these memories with certain people and they're kind of sitting in the background they're latent in your in your mind and then you see them again and all of a sudden you just remember those details. it's amazing what you can remember right so the the guys in the middle school they don't remember a lot they remember more from high school experiences the middle school experiences are small the memory smaller but what they do remember Jake is what they do they remember what they make they remember what they play, so you you have, you know, uh, Chambo and AJ retired and and Raya came back. Uh, Mike Hanley, you have a shop. We have a shop. A lot, a lot of schools have a shop. The kids remember what they make. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you have down here in the music department, Cheryl and and De, uh, DeChoso and Ariel and Lander, Mr. Pete Lander and and uh, Liz. You know, I'm with the band all the time. All my 23 years, I sit backstage. I'm always with the band. Those boys remember that. They remember those performances. They re remember that a lot. They remember being on the field. They remember what they make. The language posters, our language department in the middle school is very uh, it's a vivacious, fun department. It's really great. And when you walk through there, Jake, I'm going to give you a tour. We're going to look at some of the uh, posters they make, the boys make. And they remember those posters. They're hanging up all over the walls. Uh, they're really, mm -hmm. truly wonderful. So hats off to Jessica and, you know, Nikki and... Nikki Garcia and Nick, Nick Johnson. Oh, gosh, I'm going to leave some out. Selma, Brahma, and um, uh, Kip Diggs. Mm -hmm. And we have some Latin teachers, too. You know, a lot of fun. Chris, Chris Tiller is writing a book. Real, is coming out really soon. And, yeah. Uh, and, and Sean Northrop is uh, part-time. Hmm. Latin. Really great. Now, do you, um, in your classes, do you have to deal much with discipline and behavior? And how did you kind of figure out how to how to manage that because I I know middle school guys that they've got a lot of energy they need to get it out and it's hard to sit in a classroom for a lot of people what was that learning curve as a teacher like to uh, just make a classroom that's conducive to focus I guess I'm still working on that you know still yeah. still working on me that. too yeah so uh, <clears throat> I don't know exactly I think you get better at it as you go along I've had some uh good times and some rough years uh now i think it is the connections and, and the routines and uh, i guess the craft of teaching you learn some you know, tricks area trade and also if you're here for a long time there's sort of a they know you before you come into class but it has to it always comes back to the connection if you don't if you don't know the people you're teaching and they don't know you uh, you know, it's not going to work well mm -hmm. so it, i think it just has to come back to that connection uh that you that i have with the boys in the class yeah, I think that's very true. And I think if you, uh, I mean, it's the same in any personal relationship, too. You've got to understand what works and the right way to speak to different people. And it's all it's all people skills, mm -hmm. really, is what it is. I like to think we're on the same team, too. Right. You know, in the classroom, we're on the same team. You know, we want to get, we want to learn, we want to have fun, we want to do well. Yeah, and we're all... Yeah, I was thinking today about how much I learn from my students. Like if I just if I just let them talk or or teach the class today, I gave them certain passages to read and present in front of the the class, and I was just kind of sitting in the back, like, wow, that was a pretty good point that I never even thought mm -hmm. about before. So uh, that's also interesting too. Is they say some things that I would never think of. I just don't have that point of view or that perspective that another person in the class does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm I'm impressed every day. Every day I'm impressed by a student, and I learn from them. 
Now, have you taught the same curriculum for most of your career, or has mm-hmm. it changed? So, uh, yeah, no. Uh, it, I had six years in the county, a little bit different, uh, a little bit different. But since Gilman, I pretty much was uh, pretty much always sixth grade math teacher to the boys that math comes easy for. Mm-hmm. Uh, and eighth grade, or is the math doesn't necessarily come easy for. So the way I describe it that way is, uh, you know, if you, you've had some positive experience as a sixth grader with math, you, you tend to get good test grades, you t- it tends to come easy. If you, hit, if you hit a roadblock, you know you head that you can get through it, you can get over it. So it comes easy for you. You know, even if it's work, you know it's going to, to work and, and you persevere or whatever it is it takes to be successful. That's not necessarily the case for everybody. You know, you said you, you ran into troubles with math. So you, you running into a class of, of uh, problems and trying to do some math problems, you might hit a, a roadblock and say, oh, I can't do this or get frustrated or, you know, do something else, you know, go out and play pickleball. So the, the, um, my eighth graders over the years, you know, the, the idea is to give them a lot of support and they can do, you know, everybody can do it. It's just a matter of helping them realize they, they can do it. So that's sort of what I've been doing. Sixth graders, the math comes easy for. Eighth graders, they don't necessarily come easy for. And this year was the first year where it flip-flopped. Hmm. So, um, why, does, why does math come easy for a sixth grader? I, th- I think their prior experiences in, in fifth grade, and, it, and some people are, are pretty, pretty good in math, and it comes, it comes easy for them, and they can make those connections, and, um, and they, they sort of believe that they are good in math, and it fulfills. So uh, there's lots of reasons why you're good at math. And it's, I think it's, that's true. Confidence is very important, at least in my experience in math, mm-hmm. just believing in yourself. Because I remember taking classes with some of my really gifted math friends. Like my friend Scott Hirschman is, you know that game 24? Mm-hmm. 24 where you have to do like six times four and make 24 out of four numbers. Mm-hmm. He won some state competition in that game when we were in like fifth grade. And I always tried to keep up with him, like, oh, I, you know, Scott's in my class. I could, I could get the same grades he he has in math. But he was just naturally gifted at it. He was good at it. He's doing, you know, finance or accounting right now. He's he's that type of mind. And I always felt like when I compared myself to him or to my other friend Andrew Utter, who was very good at math too, I it hurt me because mm-hmm. I was in my own head. It, I didn't have the confidence I needed in the classroom. I think you'd be a great eighth grade algebra student, Jake, and I, I really invite you to come and sit in some word problems for us. So, uh, great. I, I know you're going to do well. Yeah, word problems. Those are tough. Those are mm-hmm. tough. Yeah. You come up with all your own questions? I do a lot. You know, I do a lot. I, I, I've been lucky. I'm sure, you've, I'm sure you've sprinkled in some pickleball questions in your... Uh, in your... Not as much as I'd like to, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I... I do a lot. I've been lucky because of I told you the Gobert, Gobertsons, uh, with with all the help they've given me over the years with Ron and and, and Sue, even Gordon's wife, you know, and, uh, and uh, it really pays off now for for me. So uh, a lot of what I know and do, um, I can pull on those. And uh, you know, we don't use a book in the math department, so I've had lots of years to to practice making making lessons, and oh. uh, it's something I like to do. Uh, you know, this year I had a lot of time to reflect, so I, I you know, I've done a couple of new things that uh, really augmented the the number theory unit for the sixth grade. So, uh, yeah, did a lot of time with it. I'm really excited about bringing that in. Uh, a lot more reading, a lot more library work uh, for the sixth graders, and a new one for my seventh, eighth graders is uh, we're all uh, doing groups of four, reading a book, um, a zero, the uh, the biography of a dangerous idea. So uh, with with this group, we'll we'll be reading it and selections and um, s- sort of summarizing and, and following interesting topics within that book, which I find fascinating. Mm-hmm. And that's sort of a, a new thing, uh, seminar approach. But I'm looking forward to that. It sounds like an interesting book, Dangerous Ideas. Yeah, yeah, it does follow. It follows the history of zero as it, it develops over time. You know, different cultures, different mathematicians, and it, it puts a, a nice nice story to it um it's in you have to read it critically because it's there are other authors and ideas that don't match up exactly but that's sort of the fun of the reading the book so uh, yeah i'll let hmm. you know how that goes it's a new one it's a work in progress hmm, that sounds yeah. great 
Mm-hmm. Um, what when you look back on your career at Gilman and all of the students that you've interacted with and met, what, what do you think has maybe changed in the typical life of a middle school student? Like, do you think that, uh, I don't know. I just know that a lot of technology has come into the, into the world now and students in the middle school had, le- had iPads a couple of years ago. I don't know if you guys still do that or not, but learning has changed. What do you think has changed, I guess, from your vantage point in the middle school? There's, it's been a long time, and there's been some change. And I hope I get this right. I'm not an expert on it. But it, it does seem like the, uh, there's a lot more specialization, a lot more individualized tutoring on, on just this test or, you know, uh, a running coach and, uh, you know, then I, I have a squash coach and a lot, a lot more specialization. Mm-hmm. And... It does. It it is good in, in one area, but I, um, you know, I, I wonder. I wonder, just to be free and and do some things, and uh, I'm not really saying it right, but the idea is is be more rounded and try new things rather than always be. In your case, like were you a lacrosse player in in junior high and high school and in college? You know, wouldn't it be neat to have polar bears or something like that thrown in? So. <laughs> So I, I wonder if the specialization is something. I'd like to think about that more, Jake, because there have there have been changes, and 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 when it happens so slowly over the course of twenty years, I don't necessarily know if I have the the, uh, the best answer for you from that one. Yeah. Well, I think you're right. I mean, there is a lot of specialization, especially in sports, but I think in all aspects of life, it's the the schedule seems to be very regimented because yeah, parents want to take advantage of you know, everything that they can in their son's life, right? Because you only have so many hours of the day, you want to suck every hour dry, basically. And I think you're right. There's maybe less time, fewer hours in the day for just free flowing play Mm -hmm. because there's more scheduling happening. Right. So I'm really proud of the middle school. Uh, The way we do things is they have a recess even in the beginning of school. They get there, there's two, there are two classes and a little recess and two more classes, lunch and some recess, two more classes, a little extended break before study hall. And then study hall isn't in athletics. So uh, our guys have time Mm -hmm. to play and have time to do things. And I I think that uh, fills that, uh, fills that need for, for them. So it's a very good model um, Mm -hmm. for a, a middle school boy. Uh, to go through the day and, you know, have classes and, and fun and free time at the same time. Yeah. And as we said before, Gilman also offers so many extracurricular opportunities such as arts and theater and sports. And, you know, you can find your niche, whatever that may be here. There really are. Yeah. You can, you, um, you know, I want to give a big shout out to, to the drama and the plays and music because that's really the boys remember that. Um, and even the graduating seniors, are, I was having a nice chat with Curtis and, and he was telling me how important being in the plays and the music has been in his life. And I just can imagine a young man like that just carrying it with him through college. He's a senior, I believe. Mm-hmm. So uh, He had a great senior speech and he talked a lot about how he found his passion for for music and singing and uh it's interesting because it only takes one moment in your life to be almost converted to your passion like him he i think he was talking about and i hope i don't get this wrong but i think his mother said you should go out for this or try out for this and he didn't know and then he did and then all of a sudden he just fell in love with it and now mm-hmm. that's what he loves to do he's he's lucky he's rare in that he's found what he loves to do in life he he also earned it. It was very hard for him uh, to get to practices. There were lots of kids in his family, you know, and trying to keep everything together, getting up to this huge amount of practice. So you know, he had to put a lot into it to be lucky. And uh, uh, I'm really happy for for Curtis. Yeah, and that's why I think it's also rare that you knew at such a young age that you wanted to be a middle school math teacher. That's that's pretty amazing too. Yeah. 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 So, um, so I had a friend, uh, I didn't jump right in, uh, out of college. I, I went to, as an adult, I had a really good friend, uh, 35 years. He's, I guess, can a friend be a mentor? mentor? For sure. Yeah. yeah. So he's in England now and we decided to go back to school together to be, uh, teachers. And he was 
with me, Andrew, last. He was with me um, in separate schools together, but shared experiences. And uh, he went into education, too. He wanted to be a Spanish teacher. And that that was uh, helpful for me. And I'm, I'm really happy I'm going to go visit him. He's in England now this summer. So nice. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Um, have, has Gilman afforded you opportunities to, to travel at all? Have you traveled much? I, I think I'd like to do more um, mm-hmm. because uh, one of my goals uh, the, over the, what's that called, um, COVID, you're sort of locked in. Mm-hmm. Everybody's in the house and new grandchild living with us. So I decided to try to learn Spanish from scratch, you know, mostly Duolingo. Uh, that, uh, that's neat. Maybe, maybe it'd be uh, fun to, to go to a place where I can practice more. Mm-hmm. Uh, the language department Oh my gosh! You know, I already said how how great they are. They're, they've been so you know since we've come back from COVID, they've been really good with with me to uh, help me practice and just stay stay excited about learning Spanish. So yeah, I'll, I'll get some more um, travel in for sure. Uh, the next one's England. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what's Duolingo like? Have Have you enjoyed it? So People it works. It. You know, it works for those it works for. So I have a thousand days. I do about twenty minutes a day. Uh, it's slow, it's slow progress. Progr- uh, I learn slowly languages, but I need more practice, and uh, I'm getting it, and I, I feel it's fun. It's <clears> fun. <throat> um, Do you have to speak at all, or is it mostly just on your phone and you're putting putting sentences together? A little bit of both. You have to speak. Yeah, a little yeah. bit of both. It, it, it's, it's forgiving on the speaking part. They changed the algorithm, but uh, it works. It works for me. Uh, it won't work as well as... Uh, speaking with people, but uh, that's next on the agenda. Now, how, I have how, how long have you been uh, studying Spanish? So a thousand days, a little bit more than a thousand days. They it tracks you. <laughs> oh, so you're you've been doing it for a while? Yeah, since COVID started. It was hard because I didn't have anybody to talk to. You, everybody's home, so it, it was a slow learning curve. And I had no prior experience with languages. So, um, but it's been a fun goal, and I've been working on it. Did you for, take Spanish growing up at all? Mm-hmm. No, I took Latin. Oh. Mm-hmm. Well, that's nice that um, that you found ta- time to do that every day. Do you have a s- certain schedule that you? So I'm part of the early riser club. The last few years, you know, uh, Matt Tully and Eileen um, and uh, Phyllis Pollard. We get there pretty early every day. Eileen Kim, mm-hmm. and uh, in order to do that, I wake up, you know, maybe four thirty-five and do the wordle. Practice my Spanish. Wordle first thing in the yeah. morning. Well, some days, yeah, sure. Cook some two eggs every day and uh, get to work early, and that's when the work gets done. Really, yeah. it's nice. Yeah, yeah, before everybody gets there. Yeah, I agree, and I have a hard time getting up out of out of bed sometimes, but I have had to recently because I'm coaching the JV squash team. Oh, cool. And uh, we practice at six in the morning at Roland Park courts. But you just feel so much more accomplished, I think, when you're up before everyone else and no one's around. You're fresh and everyone else is still asleep. You're, I'm, I don't know how old you are, but your age is much harder than my age. I, I get up without an alarm clock. So when you're in your 60s, something happens to you and you're just able to get up. That's, wow. that's the way it is. So take advantage of no it. No alarm clock. No alarm clock. Wow, I have awesome. an automatic coffee machine. I smell the coffee and hear it clicking on, and that's how I wake up. <laughs> <laughs> that's more pleasant than the, you know... The beeping. It is. It really truly is. And it works. It works. Wow. Um, Joe, what book recommendation did you did you bring today? What is what is this book? So there's a, I do audio books, uh, which really is great. Uh, and so I brought a picture of it. And this came through uh, Coach Will in, in the L.A. department. He, um, uh, football, he's a wide receiver coach for the varsity team. He recommended this, and it, what it is is Killers of the Flower Moon, and it's a, it's, it has a couple things. It, for me, personally, uh, I like uh, the historical aspect of it. It takes place in 19, starts in the 1920s. I really like that in, in all my books, fiction or nonfiction. And it, it tracks the, uh, throughout the book, it, it has a page-turner effect. Even though I audio book it, you, you really want to hear more and more and more through the whole book. I really like that in any book I have. And it keeps keeps you guessing all the way to the end. It has a nice explanation at the final, final end, but it keeps you guessing. So once you start reading this, uh, you will want to finish it. I, I can promise you that. And that's I like that. I like 
I like trying to guess the ending uh, of, of anything. Hmm. So, um, so I, re- I I do recommend it for that. The there are two storylines. The one, the, the minor storyline, is the birth of of the FBI and how it sort of blossoms under Hoover or, or or whatever. It has a detached treatment of the FBI. You have to make your own call whether it was good or bad or medium. And the main story is uh, the Osage, how they were in Oklahoma. Uh, paints a picture of the, what I see when I listen to it, a Wild West. Um, but it's small West towns, more like gun smoke than, than s- small towns in New England or something. Uh, sort of uh, wild, almost vigilante a little bit, and uh, definitely small. You know, decision-making process, the courts, and, and everything is... is sm- uh, is it colloquial? Whatever the word is. So, the and, and what happens is the Osage get dropped, uh, gets displaced and dropped in a, uh, uh, against their will in a, a reservation. It just so happens years later that that reservation is super oil rich and they own the mineral rights. So for a time they become the richest <coughs> people in America. Hmm. And here's where um, there, here's where it gets. Uh, you, you see a lot of details. You get a lot of details from this book, David G. Grant. He, he lots and lots of details, and a lot of the details that you you'll read about and you hear about when you read this book is the oppression that that, that the government and the society and and the laws and, and just everything. The Osage really had a hard time, and, and it's sort of right there for you to to think about, and it's it's, it's moving. But even more than that. It's the horror. It's, it's the horror and the evil of humans when they systematically murder scores, maybe even hundreds, of um, the Osage. Mm-hmm. And they do it usually by poison, and it's gruesome. It's, it's hor- horrific and evil, and it's part of the book. Uh, it's part of the book. So... You have to wrap your head around that. It, it, it will leave you with a feeling. I can see your, your brows are furrowed because, you know, you're probably thinking about it being an L.A. teacher. So when you, you probably will read it, uh, <laughs> and we'll talk about it later, but you will be, uh, you probably will think of, wow, those people were evil. Hmm. Why is it called Killers of the Flower Moon? So the the... There are people that the author gives you insight to, and Flower Moon is is a name. Uh, so, as different people start to be murdered, uh, you'll you will talk about the killers of of the of the people, and that that's where the name. And comes the from. Osage is a tribe, correct? A Native American tribe. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, Oklahoma. Hmm. So uh, that. Uh, that was great, and I really appreciate uh, Coach Will for, for recommending uh, that book to me. I, I like books on audio, yeah. but I, I believe you know it's pretty easy to get everywhere. Interesting how you say that it's a page-turner on audio. audio yeah. You just want to keep listening to it. Mm, pretty much, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I've definitely seen that title around, and um, it's interesting. I saw a, a painting this weekend. I went to the... Uh, I don't know if this is in Oklahoma or where this is set, but this is a... Native American on horseback, and uh, I don't know if you can see. I can see it. Yeah, yeah, on horseback. And I was looking at this. It's a massive painting. She's ready to check it out. And uh, it's a massive painting in the National Gallery. And I was just thinking to myself, "Wow, we've we've come a long way from what the natives had to do for food." And for survival and for warmth, this guy is on a horseback just spearing a buffalo in the, in the Great Plains. And uh, thinking about, you know, today you just kind of walk down. You can just walk down to lunch or walk over to lunch, and it's just a whole different world. And it wasn't it wasn't that long ago. No. You know? No, it wasn't. Turn of the century. So I, I would like to come to your um, L.A. class and visit and maybe uh, talk about the book a little bit and see what an upper school uh, – LA class does do you do books in your class for sure yeah 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 so is uh, it is it it's all a true story right it's not fictionalized so I I believe um, that there's so much information in it that I I believe 90% is is really good 
information, and you know you have to read critically for for everything else, uh, I, just like any anything else. But I do I do feel like it is is it's nonfiction. Yes. Now, um, uh, when was the FBI? What what era was the FBI? Uh, so I'm pretty bad with created. dates, but let, let's say 30s or 40s, and I, I'm probably wrong. And there was a the good guy uh, in this in this book was a Texas Ranger to start. So he was pretty, uh, you know, you could almost envision the cowboy outfits or in book. And he was hired as an early FBI agent. And uh, he was, he's sort of the moral compass. Now, I'm not giving anything away because you learn that pretty early, but I don't want to tell you about the, the other parts because you have to read it for yourself. The, but he's sort of the moral compass in this. He goes through the investigation of these murders on behalf of the FBI and gives you a little insight on what the FBI at the time is, is thinking about and how it, how it changed from you know, hiring maybe someone that was a Texas Ranger to white shirts and ties and college graduates, which oftentimes associated with FBI's and, and now a, a different type of approach. But uh, you got to remember the the blend there where where it picked the FBI was picking up and and where uh, the crimes were committed a sort of rough time, lots of lots of uh, people uh, secret what do they call it uh, Wells Fargo. Uh, uh, what's it? What's a like? You secret. pay someone to to go be a security guard type thing, you know? Uh, secret service. Yeah, like not a secret service, but uh, you're working for. They were sort of working for the bad guys, so to speak. Uh, uh, yeah. Undercover. Yeah, there you go. Uh, that type of thing. There was a lot of that going on, and just uh, just a just a a lot where where the two worlds are colliding. A lot of uh, bad things were happening, hmm. and. Uh, doesn't doesn't paint the FBI as a bad organization or anything, but it does give you some some insight of uh, how it developed over the years. Hmm. It's the subplot, I guess you could say. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm gonna have to check it out. Is it a long book? Does it take a while? I'm not a huge audio book guy, but I'd love to pick pick up the physical version and and read it. So I don't have the physical version. Uh, I don't think it would be a long book. It didn't take you too long to listen to. Mm, it was. It didn't take me too long to listen to because once I started, I wanted to finish. So I uh, go exercise or get some, you know, do some walks or scoot as I like to scoot my scooter all over town, and I'll listen to uh, to a book while I'm scooting. Oh, oh! Tell me about the scooter. So you know, I'm in my 60s now. I used to like to walk. Or, you know, people run. Uh, I like to cover distance all over Baltimore. I look for the nooks and crannies uh, everywhere. You know, I go everywhere. So the way I, I did that is I used to rent scooters, you know, the electric kind. It was a lot of fun. But I just bought a push scooter, and I live on the light rail. I'll, I'll go all over and do marathons, but <laughs> on, a, on a scooter. So it's a lot easier for me, and I cover a lot of distance. And it, it allows – some people like to fish. Uh, some people like to do different things, take walks or exercise, run, run marathons. Uh, for my private time or, you know, to get away – uh, oh. That's a great form of exercise for me because I like to explore uh, free form, just scoot around all over Baltimore, and then I can listen to books and think about things. It's fun. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite, I guess you said nooks and crannies of Baltimore, but hidden gem in Baltimore? So when people ask me about Baltimore, at first I didn't really have much to say because I moved down here and I didn't love Baltimore right away, but it took me a while to find a lot of these hidden gems, restaurants, right. cool places, nice views, different locations in the city, different areas to go to. What are some of your favorites in, in the city? So it's easy for me, you know, I, I, it's the harbor. I was there opening day years and years ago. That's a long time ago, Jake. And I met my wife, a uh, bartender waitress, you know, working in the harbors back in the 80s. Uh, I've, I go there a lot, walk around, just look at the water. Um, it's just a great place to me. For I, I like the rebirth. It's, it was sad what happened to the harbor for the last 10 years. Uh, but there's a nice rebirth. And I lived, my first place was really close to there. And I, I worked so I could walk to work. It's sort of part of what I um, experienced as, as a, a younger man. And then... As you walk, uh, you know, Fells Point, of course, I lived and worked in Fells Point for 12 years. Mm -hmm. So they, the harbor in Fells Point, and to some extent Canton, are, are the, the nooks and crannies that I like, and it's part of my life. 
but there's plenty of places um, that that make Baltimore unique. You know, close to here is Hamden is is really cool, and you get some pasta at Granos, and you know. I've never been to Granos. Well, we recommend it. It's right on the corner. There you get go. some carryout pasta, and you get two meals out of it. So there you go. <laughs> Now, can I ask you, uh, so when you met your wife, did you leave your your name and so- something on the receipt? So we worked or, together. Oh, you worked together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were hired at the same time, a uh, place in, in the harbor. It was the happening spot back then, believe it or not. It was, the lines were out the thing. and uh, So we worked in this restaurant and, you know, bartender, waitress. And uh, it took her a couple of years to like me. And once she did, you know, <laughs> we got married. There you go. Yeah. Gave it some time. Gave her some time. Man, it's not easy working in a restaurant. I know Trezor and I have, have talked about that before, but I I worked at an Italian restaurant for probably a year, under a year, and Italian restaurants are so small, and I was a busboy, so I was going around and just cleaning off tables, filling up water, you know. When the dishwasher came out, I, I, would, I would dry the wine glasses and put them back. And one night, I was drying the wine glasses and they're so small and delicate and i had my hand down there and i broke one yeah cut yourself and i did it probably you know three more times that week Mm -hmm. and frankie finally the the owner of the restaurant called fellini's just never called me back that was it i broke too many of his uh of his of his dishes (laughs) you just weren't cut out for it i was not cut out to work in an italian restaurant so i i don't know i've always enjoyed it uh, you know, when I said I went back to school as an adult, I worked nights uh, in, in different, in Fells Point. I, I was a bartender at the Cat's Eye Pub, you know, and for years. Love that place. Yeah, and uh, I've always worked in good places that way. So that's how I made it through college and grad school and my first two years of teaching to supplement, you know, the, the pay. Uh, it was fun. You know, it's actually a fun job. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Finally, you have one more thing uh, here, this is this yours, this thing for So, you know, you were talking about uh, the support of the boys. And in the middle school, there's a, there a lot of uh, uh, support. And you have Sean Hall and then uh, Katie, Katie um, Schmidt and Lynn, Lynn Nichols. They, last year, Katie and I were coaching together, and I was talking about uh, how I decorate for Thanksgiving. And the next day I come in, and she made this, you know. And I think today being um, – Day, the convocation thankful day and I, I feel really thankful um so and i got a lot of support so that's that's why i brought that but if you just think about you know what the boys get in the middle school you got you got joe valentine white and Danell thompson and amy summers and uh their uh kate mose main's lineup and flip around uh just a lot of support it, you know, there's just a lot of support for the guys, and, and I feel it, too, uh, and, and I, just, I just feel it, too. So I brought this in, something that someone made from Gilman. Thank you, Katie. And uh, I, you know, as we're finishing up, I just came off of a sort of a medical, you know, cancer. I had prostate cancer. It came back. And uh, the middle school, my, my work family, you know, I am so appreciative uh, for everything they have done for me and made me my recovery so good over the last uh, several months as I'm going through these treatments. It, it is it's just what I wanted to to when I came on here. I, I just wanted to make sure that I publicly, publicly and forever am recorded uh, that how much I appreciate my work family and how much I'm overflowed with gratitude and, and frankly, how happy I am mm-hmm. uh, in life uh, and largely uh, because of, of my work family and, uh, and Gilman in general, but in the middle school in particular. So uh, I'm glad you, you asked about that, thankful. And I, I'll be sitting there listening to the turkey tango and thinking about how wonderful it is to, to be with this great group of people. Love that, Joe. Thank you very much. And yeah, Turkey Tango is is a highlight. And I think this time of year, as you said, it's just a great time to reflect and be thankful and grateful for work family is a great way to put it. I like that because Mm -hmm. Gilman really is a a family, people taking care of each other, supporting each other and, you know, being there for each other. So, so thank you very much. And um, thank you for coming on the the podcast today. It was a lot of fun. Chesue, thank you. Chesre, yep. the man. And uh, thank you, Jake. We'll Thanks, see Sean. you on the court, right? Yes, sir. I'll see you on the pickleball court. All right. Perfect. Thanks a lot.